everlasting. Mercy of the Lord from everlasting to everlasting. Mercy of the Lord. Mercy of the Lord. Good morning, church. 
Welcome to all who are gathered with us this morning at our church building and on our live stream. Our call to worship this morning is Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. For he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Let us pray. God of unfailing light, in your realm of glory, the poor are blessed, the hungry are filled, and every tear is wiped away. Strengthened by this vision, may we follow in the way of holiness, made known by your Son in life and death. Amen. Come on, why don't you stand up on your feet with us this morning. We're going to worship together with this hymn. I love this beautiful hymn. Would you sing it loud with us for the beauty? Come on, let's sing. For the beauty.
our series together then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my time.
God, this is our response. How great you are. We look around and we see not only things that are beautiful, but things that are painful. We see suffering, we see sorrow, we see joy, we see laughter. All of it is you, and we are grateful this morning. You are in every moment, God, and you are in us. And so this morning, our souls respond how great you are. Can we just do that one more time? Just respond together. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul. say how great is our God in this in this room this morning would you just say amen amen you be seated well good morning church it's great to see you all and everyone who joined the uh, live broadcast thank you for joining as well today's reading is in the gospel of John chapter 3 Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these things that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and flesh. I'm sorry, water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we, what we know and testify to what we have seen. Yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who had descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him who may have eternal life. For God has so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The word of the Lord. Did you think that your feet had been bound by what gravity brings to the ground Did you feel you'd been tricked by the future you picked Well come on down All these rules don't apply when you're high in the sky So come on down We're coming down Better place to go. We got 
Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for that, uh, Peter Gabriel. I mean, Mikhail Larinaga. <laughs> uh, so we continue our series, Then Sings My Soul, looking at the power of songs and the way in which they can shape us. This particular one is not a very popular one, I think. Um, how many of you have even heard that song before? All right, so three of us. So it was a song that Peter did kind of for the Disney movie Wall-E. And I realize that a lot of us maybe aren't kind of watching Disney films that much anymore. But this particular one, it came out in 2008, so that's a few years ago. And the hero, Wally, -E, uh, stood for Waste Allocation Load Lifter Earth Class. <laughs> he, was a, he was a trash compactor. And it, it's an animated film. And he's the hero, and he falls in love with another kind of android. Her name is Eva. Uh, and so it's not, it's not very subtle. He's kind of the new Adam and she's the Eve. And it's supposed to develop this, this idea of kind of refurbishing the earth. But the reason that I wanted to talk about that song is because for too long, I think, Christianity has been shared in such a way that it's only about your soul and it's only about somewhere else that somehow we're gonna save your souls and then you're gonna leave this place and go somewhere else and that's really what God is up to. But that story is not the story we actually find in the Gospels. It's not the story we find in the New Testament. 
God, or for the Old Testament for that matter, the Bible opens with the story of creation. And God is the creator. And God creates this whole universe, this world, and he says it is good. And that story then gets played out as God is on this path to restore the world, to save it, to redeem it. And we first see that in the incarnation of his son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Jesus came in human flesh. The word that was with God and was God in the beginning, the word through whom all things were created, became flesh and dwelt among us, full, and grace, full of grace and truth. And his name is Jesus. So that the incarnation of Jesus, that God coming in the flesh, is this radical affirmation of the goodness of creation. If creation weren't good, Jesus would not have come in the flesh. He could have just come as a spirit. He could have come and like appeared to be the flesh, but not actually been flesh, right? He could appear to be human, but not actually been human. And there were some in the early church that argued that that was the case. They argued that Jesus wasn't actually a human. He just looked like one. And they wanted to kind of emphasize the divinity of Jesus. And in uh, 2 John, the, there are three epistles by John there at the end of the New Testament, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. And in 2 John, the elder is saying, look, there's a really dangerous teaching that's out there. And it's starting to infiltrate the church it's so dangerous that I would rather you not even talk about it. Like, shut the door. Keep out the devil. That's a different song. Right. But not, not even talk about it. And here's what that teaching was. Here's what was so dangerous that the elders said, it's better not even to discuss it. Because there are some people who are saying Jesus wasn't actually human. And the elder says, that is the spirit of Antichrist. Hmm, that's tough, right? That's a big one, right? You don't want to be called the spirit of Antichrist. little Bible trivia for you here. There are two books in, in the Bible that contain the word Antichrist. Only two. Now, I've just told you one of them was 2 John. <laughs> so, the other, anybody want to guess? Matthew. Matthew, that's a good guess. In Matthew, it says false Christs. It doesn't actually use the term Antichrist, but it's a similar idea. Somebody else? No? You don't want to, you don't want to say because you don't know. I get it. It's like I'm back in the classroom. Don't look at the professor when they ask you a question, right? Uh, so, yeah, so Daniel um, does talk about, uh, well, Daniel actually focuses more on the one like the Son of Man, right? The Ancient of Days. There are these kind of beasts that the one like the Son of Man overcomes, but there are four beasts. They're, they're, they don't use that term. Second Thessalonians will use the man of lawlessness. So some people associate it with that. Uh, the book of Revelation uses the term beast. But the only other place the term Antichrist appears is in 1 John. In 1 John and 2 John. That's it. And there, in both cases, it's associated with this idea that somehow Jesus wasn't human. So we need to hold on to this concept of the humanity of Jesus. And I, I want to take it a step further. So in the beginning, God created and said it was good. Then Jesus came in the flesh, which is affirmation of the goodness of creation. Then Jesus dies on a cross, right, for our sins. And if that were the end of the story, Jesus could have gone on to heaven post-death on the cross the same way that our loved ones had, right? We all have people that we've loved, that knew the Lord, that are no longer with us. And we say they've gone to be with the Lord. So why didn't Jesus just do that? Why didn't Jesus just go on to be with the Father the same way my grandmother did or my mom and dad have? That's not the story we have, right? The story we have is that Jesus was resurrected from the tomb. A bodily resurrection. The tomb is empty. Like this is quintessential Christian belief. But if Jesus' body was resurrected, if, if the birth of Jesus and the incarnation of Jesus is this affirmation of the goodness of creation, then the resurrection of that body 
is a radical reaffirmation of the goodness of creation. I mean, Paul will say later that we are new creatures in Christ. He uses that language. So that it is us. Like the faith is not just something that goes on in your head. It's not just a matter of you understanding something or thinking something about Christ. And you, you might be able to appreciate that and say, yes, it's not just my thoughts, it's my feelings. But I'm going to tell you today, it's not just about what goes on in your heart. Like sometimes we will use the term think and believe like they're synonyms, right? I think this is true, I believe this is true. Like that sounds like a synonym, right? But for the Jews, that wasn't the case. Um, belief, faith was something that you didn't just do inside your head. It was something that you did in your heart, and it wasn't something you did just in your heart. It was something you did in your body. You embodied your faith. You lived it, right? To have faith in someone is to place your trust in them. And this, this is what I think a song like um, Peter Gabriel's song about coming down to the earth, having our feet planted on solid ground can teach us, can in a way remind us of an old story that we serve the creator of the universe, that he said this place is good and that he's coming to save it. This story out of John 3 that, that we just heard read, Micah read it for us, right? It has that ever so popular passage you know, maybe the most popular passage. You see it at sporting events. Sometimes people just hold up signs and it says, John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he sent his only one and only son that whosoever believes in him might have eternal life. But we stop there. And, but Jesus didn't stop there. Because he said, because God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. That's a big part of this. God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but that the world might be saved. Let me, let me, let me frame it like this. Perhaps you've heard this story before that Jesus died on a cross and that he was resurrected and therefore you, your soul can be saved. That is true, but that's not the end of the story. In fact, I might go as far to suggest that that's the beginning of the story. That you're, you're saved from sin and death. But, but God's salvation of you from sin and death wasn't just to rescue you so you could be saved. You're not just saved from something. You are saved for something. And the thing that you are saved for is God's world. We're saved for the world so that we can be the body of Christ in the world. So we can be the ones, the, the ambassadors of the kingdom sent out into the world. Like, this, this is what God is actively doing, and we have now the privilege and the responsibility of those who have been saved from sin and death so that we might be used by God to share that gospel, that good news in the world. Paul will say this too. He'll talk about, don't be unequally yoked. You should be yoked with Christ. Do you know this passage? It's from 2 Corinthians. Um, for those of you who kind of grew up in church, this is a very common passage to talk about in youth groups. I don't, I don't know if you know the, the typical youth pastor interpretation. I think it's youth pastors. If you don't know the youth pastor interpretation of this, as it's often been interpreted, it goes something like this. Um, Paul tells us not to be unequally yoked. That means you should not date a non-Christian. Right? Now, because, you know, dating evangelism is typically is not very effective. Uh, the the non-believer seems to have more influence on the believer than the other way around. Look, all of that may be true. That has nothing to do with what Paul was saying in 2 Corinthians. 
has nothing to do with it. You're not to be yoked to the world so that you function like the world. You're to be yoked to Christ. But if you are yoked to Christ, where do you think you will be? You will be in the world because that's where Christ is, actively in the world, loving it, serving it, dying for it. That's what it means to be yoked to Christ, is to be like Christ. But to be like Christ is not to be separated from the world, but to be placed in the world and to function like Christ does in the world. Hence, we call ourselves the body of Christ. We say this when we come to the table, right? Behold what you are, but become what you receive. So that we, we, we pray, Heavenly Father, send down your spirit upon these gifts. Make them the body and blood of Christ. So that as we partake of them, we might become the body of Christ sent out into the world. You've also heard this too. That we are in the world, but not of the world. But when we say that, we often act like that we are going to be somewhere else. Somewhere in outer space, like in Wally, -E, like the, the, the human population of the Earth in that movie, the, the Disney animated film, they're, they're up on this giant uh, cruise ship, right? And everybody's super obese because everything's automated for them, and they're just living up there centuries on centuries on centuries because they burnt the Earth up and it's no longer useful. As though that's, you know, our vision of the afterlife. I'm going to go to heaven, and it's up there somewhere, and all my needs are met. It's like this eternal cruise, right? Uh, um, give me a cruise line. Carnival. Mm, that's more like for the young folks. Don't think carnival. That's a little too worldly. Give me another one. Royal Caribbean. That's a good one. Yeah, it's kind of for families. This is a family comedy. Right? Yeah. It's like this. We imagine, we imagine heaven is some kind of eternal royal Caribbean in the sky. But listen to the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, the one in the heavens, let your name be sanctified. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done as in heaven, also upon earth. As in heaven, also upon earth. We're praying that God's kingdom, that God's will, that is already realized in the spiritual realm of things, will come and be on earth as in heaven. That's what we're praying for. And that's what the return of Christ will look like. It will look like the kingdom of God coming here. That's what Jesus preached most of the time. Jesus came preaching the good news, the gospel. And what did he say? The kingdom of God is at hand. That's what he said. The kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is coming. It's not about us going somewhere. It's about God coming here. And when God comes here, he's going to make the wrong things right. And it's going to involve us in the process so I just want to be really clear here. I'm not saying that somehow the gospel is, doesn't include the salvation of your souls. It does include that. You are saved from sin and death. And if, and if you haven't made a profession of faith, I would love to talk to you about that. I'd love to, to talk to you and pray with you so that you can make that profession of faith. You can identify with Christ. You can receive the forgiveness that has already been offered to you. But what I want you to know is that that's not the end. That's the beginning. Because as I said it, I said it just a second ago, I'm going to say it again, I'll probably say it again later, that we are not simply saved from something, we are saved for it. We're saved from sin and death, but we are saved for the world so that we can be like Christ, laying our lives down for others. One of the ways that Jesus would talk about this embodied life, this faith that you practice and that you, you live, this trust that you place in him, he used this image, this image of being salt and light, right? You're to be salt, you're to be light, you're to be a city on a hill. 
I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a relatively new TV show called The Chosen. And it's quite popular, especially among Christians. It depicts Jesus in a very three-dimensional, very kind of believable kind of way. Um, it's, the production value, I think, is really high. Um, I want to show you a clip from that TV show. It's the bit where Matthew is talking to Jesus, and it's like they're trying to prep for Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And Matthew gets to this point where he says, salt and light, and he goes, Jesus, what do you really mean by that? And this, this is their depiction of that story. Let's, let's watch it together, and I'll be right back. You, do you realize how heavily laden your sermon is with these kinds of ominous pronouncements? I haven't even named half of them. It's a manifesto, Matthew. I'm not here to be sentimental and soothing. I'm here to start a revolution. Well, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That isn't exactly... I said revolution, not revolt. I'm talking about a radical shift. Did you think I was just going to come here and say, hey, everyone, just uh, keep doing what you've been doing for the last thousand years since it's been going so great? Also, there's the beginning and the end. What about the beginning? The concern about the beginning is more logistical. Right now, your opening line is, you are the salt of the earth. I'm worried, particularly if it is windy, or if the crowd is larger than we expect, that people near the back will hear, salt the earth, and it will immediately call to mind a negative connotation. The Punic Wars? Yes. When Rome destroyed Carthage, they sowed the city with salt to make it barren and to curse anyone who would rebuild upon it. I share your concern about the opening line, but for different reasons. I think the sermon needs some sort of introduction, an invitation into what, as you have rightly pointed out, will be a complex and at times challenging set of teachings. What does you are the salt of the earth even mean? I'm not good at metaphor. Salt preserves meat from corruption. It slows its decay. I want my followers to be a people who hold back the evil of the world. Salt also enhances the flavor of things. I want my followers to renew the world and be part of its redemption. Salt can also be mixed with honey and rubbed on the skin for maladies. I want my people to participate in the healing of the world, not its destruction. Then why not just say that? <laughs> Come on, Matthew. Allow me a little poetry, huh? Not everyone is like you. Some people like a little flavor. Read the songs of David or, or Solomon. I'm not going nearly as far with metaphor as Solomon. I'm reading him next. Well, good luck. He's probably... <laughs> yeah. I told you. These things will make sense to some, but not to others. I don't want passive followers. Those who are truly committed will peer deeply into it, looking for truth. But I do agree with you. We shouldn't begin with salt. You make a valid point. Good work. All right, so there's, there's a fair amount of poetic license there. We don't know that there was that kind of conversation took place. But I think it did capture a lot of what I see being said in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Jesus is not looking for passive followers. He's looking for active participants. That's, that's the second part of the equation, right? That we are saved for something. We are to be salt. We are to be light. I mean, we... We taught you this when you were a kid, right? You had you hold up your finger and you sang that little song, this little light of mine, and put it under a bushel, you shout no, right? Oh, yeah. You remember that one? No, I don't. Oh, you don't remember that one? Well, that, was, that was old school. We'll have to, we'll have to bring it back. <laughs> we'll have to bring it back. Yeah, not right now. Thank you. <laughs> years and years ago, I attended a conference, and this lady was speaking and she titled her talk, Out of the Salt Shaker and Into the World. I was maybe 18 when I first heard it. I've heard it a couple of times. She must like that talk. I heard, 
like four or five years later, I heard her give the same talk, like exactly the same talk. But yeah, we, we call that little utensil on the table a salt shaker. And the salt that's there in the shaker is good. And maybe that's what Jesus is calling us to be, like salt that sits in a salt shaker. Except salt in a salt shaker doesn't do us any good. Right? It has to get out of the salt shaker and into the world. And sometimes, at least in the, in the case of a salt, sh- salt shaker, it has to be shook up. Right? you got to shake it to get the salt out. And I guess... We could look back at the last year and a half or two years in a way in which we've all been shaken. You know, none of us anticipated early 2020 that there was going to be a global pandemic, that we would have friends get sick, we'd have some friends that would die, we would have an economy that would break, we would have friends, friendships that would break over political positions about how the pandemic should be thought of. But maybe, maybe we can just see all the difficulty that we've had as a shaking. And maybe that shaking, and I don't want to be misunderstood here, I'm not saying that God caused the pandemic. I think it's evil. And I don't think God causes evil. But I do think that God can respond to evil in ways that destroys it and overcomes it. And I think one way God might use us to overcome that evil is for that shaking to create in us some activity in our lives and in our communities and in our church and in our world. I need you. And and you need others. We need each other. It is time to be all in, all in with our time, with our attendance, with our energy, with our resources, to make a difference in our community, to care for one another, and to reach out and to care for new folks who might be in various forms of need, to be salt and to be light, but not just to be it but to be salt and light that's used by God in the world. To come down to the ground, as the song says. Not just be up there in the sky. It's another old adage we used to say. They're so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. That was a critique of of some spiritual types in the church. But man, there's some truth to that one. We can be so heavily minded that we are no earthly good. But salt and light is for the earth. That's who it's for. So we receive God's love and we're grateful for that. We, and we receive God's forgiveness and we're grateful for that. But now, having been forgiven and having been loved... We are now to be agents of that love and agents of that forgiveness. And it can start in our families, in our friendships, in our coworkers, or our fellow students. Reach out to our neighbors. Include especially those who are different than us. To find ways to dialogue and to compromise and to care to defer. It's it's not a message that you're hearing elsewhere, right? You're You're not hearing this when you're online in your social media feeds. If you're watching the news. It's all polemics, right? Everything is us against them. And what I'm telling you is God has saved us for them. And that requires us. It requires us to lean into God. Because I don't think we get to the place where we actually become salt and light, being used as salt and light by sheer force of our own will. 
It's not like trying harder gets us there. It's our devotion to God. It's, it's leaning into God that that shapes us into those types of people. It's regularly, look, I know I'm the preacher, and so you think I have to say that you should come to church often. But that's, listen to me here. You regularly come, you pray, you hear scripture read, you sing, you greet one another with grace and peace, you come to the table, you receive the sacrament, that regular practice of that, of being told you're loved and you're forgiven. Regularly, it takes some time, but that, that will shape you into a person who more readily forgives and loves so that you can be, again, the very instrument of God's work in the world. To be chosen, that's what that means. To be chosen, to be elect, to be set apart. It's been sanctified, right? Something that is sanctified, something that's chosen or elect, means it's, it's, been, it's used for a purpose. These utensils that we, the, we use, these plates, these cups, have been set apart for God. Again, to be set apart for God's use, not just set apart to be apart from, but set apart to be used by God. Here on earth, with good old flesh and blood people that God made and God loves and God died for and God is saving and God is calling us to participate in that work. So what are we going to do? This is what we're going to do. We're going to pray, right? We're going to have the prayers of the people, but in the prayers of the people today, we're going to have a time for you to come and be prayed for. And maybe that prayer is your prayer of, yes, I want to be active. I want to, I want to profess my faith. I want to be saved from sin and death. And if that's where you are today, then I can't tell you how happy I am to pray with you to be saved from sin and death. But let's say you have been saved from sin and death. But you want to pray that you'll be saved not just from those things, but for what God has for you in the world. Man, I want to pray for you too. And having prayed those things, we're going to share the grace and peace with one another. That's just practice. When you, when you offer grace and peace with somebody in church, that's just practice for what you need to be doing every day of the week when you see other people sharing with them grace and peace. And then, as always, we'll come to the table because that's our nourishment. That's where we receive from God our forgiveness. Right? Because it's only as we're forgiven that we are prepared to then go out and forgive. So let's pray. Your love for us is so vast and so amazing, a love that is not just for us, but one that is inclusive of the whole world. In your death and resurrection, you conquered death and brought us into a union with the Father. You and the Father are one, and we are in you, making us one in the Father as well. Loving Savior, you taught us to be like salt in the world slowing the earth's decay as we hold back evil, adding flavor as we actively participate in the earth's renewal and redemption, becoming a healing balm to bring about peace in a broken world. 
May we be the light that expels the darkness, revealing your love. May we be the light that guides and directs others to you. May we be the agents of your mercy and grace, the very presence of Christ in the world, your agents of transformation. Holy Spirit, you have chosen us not only for our salvation, but you have chosen us to be used by you to bring about a transformation in the hearts of your people. You have not saved us from the world, but for the world. May we take this commission seriously, knowing that in partnering with you, we can help bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. Today, we weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who are rejoicing. If you have a need or would like to pray with a pastor, we would invite you now to come down to the front and pray with one of our leaders uh, that are coming up now. If you're joining us online, a reminder to share your request or thanksgiving in the chat or leave a comment requesting prayer and a pastor will contact you. Thank you, Lord, for your gift of salvation. 
thank you for your great love for all peoples of the earth. Thank you for allowing us to participate in your plan of redemption for the world. Guide and direct our words, our actions, and our steps as we seek to be your hands and your feet in a world longing for you. Amen. Amen. Would you pray this with me? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. So in a moment we will gather um, as we always do at the table together. But now that we've offered prayers, it's time for us to greet one another, share grace and peace, and connect with someone maybe you haven't seen in a while or introduce yourself to someone new.
So we have servers who are coming now. They're going to distribute for us the elements of communion. Uh, if you're new to us, one of our kind of COVID uh, things that we've done is we've, there are two cups there. They're kind of stacked on top of each other. So as you go to pick it up, make sure you get, there's two there, and the bottom one holds the bread and the top one holds the juice. So coming to the table, receiving communion, is one of those kind of great symbols of embodiment, of the, the renewal of creation. Um, I mean, one of the things from that clip from the TV show, Chosen, you know, the Jesus character there says, I'm trying to start a, a revolution. And the Matthew character goes, yeah, but what kind of revolution is it? Because you're like, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And he goes, it's a revolution, not a revolt. <laughs> right? It's, it's actively engaging, but it's not actively engaging in a way that the world would typically engage. I think two of the, I mean, obviously the big symbols of Christianity are like the cross and the empty grave. And I think the cross and the empty grave represent that part of the story of what we're saved from. We're saved from sin and death. Um, but there are other symbols that represent Christianity too. A towel, I think, is a good representation of Christianity. Jesus uses the towel to wash the feet of the disciples. And the, the bread and wine are symbols symbols of his body and blood, symbols of forgiveness. And I, I've said this before, but I think, again, it bears repeating. It's interesting, symbolically, as, as again, the, character, the Jesus character in the, in the TV show, you know, he's like, give me, let me, give me a break, let me use a little bit of poetry. Poetically, symbolically, it's significant think, that we don't bring to the table grapes and grain. That's just naturally in the world, grapes and grain. We, we bring to the table bread and wine. It takes, it takes effort to make those things from the earth. So we're kind of bringing our work to the table. Like the, the, the old term for worship or worship service was liturgy. But liturgy just means the work of the people. So we, we do our work. Jesus, again, isn't looking for passive followers. He's looking for active participants. So we do our work. And God is gracious enough to take our work that we offer to him and to bless it and to create new things from it. I know it doesn't look like much. There's not much here that could do anything, right? For those who've been around a while in our communion liturgy, remember I used to always say, um, may it nourish our bodies, may it nourish our souls. You have to think, God's going to have to do a lot for this to nourish our bodies. <laughs> but I think, I think that's the God we serve. We, do, we serve the God that does a lot. God would have to do a lot with me to make me to become a member of the body of Christ. God would have to do a lot with you to make you a useful agent of grace, mercy, and forgiveness in the world. But we're talking about the God who created all things. The God to whom there is no limits. The God who loves, who serves, who dies, who gives new life. So we come to the table again today because it is the table of the Lord. Not the table of the church, but the table of the Lord. It is made ready for those who love him and those who want to love him more. So whether you've been here often or whether you've not been here long, come because it is the Lord's will that you would meet him here. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would send down your Holy Spirit upon these gifts. Make them into the body and blood of Christ. And as we partake of them, Lord, make us 
to be the faithful body of Christ sent out into all the world. In Jesus' name and in the power of the Spirit, we pray. Amen. Let's now confess the mystery of the faith. So let's say this together. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and he gave thanks, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. Let's take and eat together. And as was their custom after the meal, Jesus took the cup, and he said, this is my blood, which was shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's take and drink together. God in heaven, we love you. But Lord, we want to love you more. We come not out of our riches, but out of our poverty, not out of our strength, but out of our weakness. Lord, we come and we pray, help us see who and what we are, but Lord, transform us into that which we receive. Let us be the body of Christ. Let us be those active participants in your kingdom. In the precious name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, I love, I love these, these sing, sing My Soul series. I like music, and I like talking about the way in which music can help us see and feel and know and experience things we can't otherwise do. Mikhail's coming now, and he's going to give us... Um, uh, yes, thank you. He's going to let us know a few ways that we can be active uh, participants uh, this week and what's going on here around the church. Be sure to bail me out, too, if I get stuck like that, all right? Appreciate it. Morning, everybody. Uh, before we kind of depart from this time at the table, we are going to receive our tithes and offerings. As always, there's four ways you can give. You can give here in person. There is a box in the back of the auditorium as well as at the welcome desk. You can give online at oasischurch.org slash give. You can give any amount to 84321 and follow the prompts to complete that contribution. And then you can also give via the Church Center app, which is an easy and convenient way to give. You can see where we are kind of month to date uh, up on the screen. Uh, as you can see, we're a little less than $6,000 shy of our monthly goal. The good news is we have this Sunday and next Sunday to make that up, so uh, please give accordingly and generously. Let's uh, recite this giving confession together, would you? We believe that every good thing comes from God and that God's goodness is freely given. We devote ourselves to lives of generosity and resist the covetous ways of this world. We denounce the myth of scarcity and proclaim the abundance of your provision. Lord, teach our hearts to give joyfully and enrich us with that which does not corrupt or decay. Amen. Amen. Uh, so a few announcements we have. First of all, uh, if you are visiting with us today, if you're new here, uh, if you've started attending recently, we want to get to know you better. Uh, to, and we also have a free gift for you. So uh, if you uh, haven't done so already, go ahead and take a few moments and fill out one of the communication cards. They should be in a lot of the seat backs around the auditorium. Uh, just give a little bit of information. And if you bring that to the welcome desk, we do have a free gift for you. It is a, a premium coffee mug with the Oasis logo on it. And then we also have a card that's good for four free breakfasts. So your next four breakfasts are on us. Doesn't get any better than that. Coffee, mug, coffee, and breakfast. Come on, it's perfect. Uh, all you gotta do is fill out that information. So um, we do tonight, everybody say tonight. tonight. Tonight we have a night of worship uh, starting at 7 p.m. I'm really excited about this. Uh, we're gonna do this kind of uh, apropos to our uh, then sings my soul. We're going to kind of uh, do kind of a uh, stripped back, kind of relaxed version. Uh, I like to call it kind of living room worship where we're going to get together and without much pretense or agenda at all, we're just going to worship together. Um, I really do believe that in times 
where uh, people get together and with no other kind of purpose or agenda, just seek God. I do believe God responds to that. I believe God shows up and I believe that whatever it is that whatever stage of life you're in, uh, whatever you're going through, whatever challenges you face, I think that often God comes to us in worship and ministers to us in ways that we can't really express or even expect. So um, please come to that tonight. We're going to get together a little bit early. Uh, starting at 6.30, we're going to have coffee and cookies in the, in the lobby. So worship starts at 7, but come at 6.30, have a cup of coffee, hang out with us in the lobby. Uh, Tuesday night at 6.30, we're going to be having our Peace Community Problems Assembly. Um, now, that I know that that name sounds like not a fun event, right? It has the word problems in it. <laughs> But uh, this is a really important thing. For those of you who are not aware, Oasis is a member congregation of an organization called Peace. It's a kind of, um, it's a, um, I don't know how to describe it. It's kind of a, a group of churches that have gotten together and for the purpose of promoting the welfare of people who are disenfranchised and marginalized, we get together and use our collective voice, our collective influence to try and promote, uh, try and kind of organize and promote the kind of common welfare of people among us who often don't have a voice. So um, this uh, Tuesday at 6.30, we're going to get together on Zoom. Uh, there's going to be a link emailed to everybody if you're on the mailing list. If you're not on the mailing list, those communication cards, just fill out one of those and drop it in the box. We'll make sure you get that link. But we would really, really, really love if everyone who considers Oasis to be their home church was on this Zoom call. Even if you can't like be on camera, if you're there, we use kind of our collective voices. Our collective presence is really where our power comes from in these. So uh, if you can be there on Tuesday night, uh, you don't need to like say anything or do anything. You just kind of have to be there. So uh, keep an eye out for that email. We will send that out this week. Tuesday night, 6.30 on Zoom. Mark it on your calendars. Friday, the 29th, we're having our heebie-jeebie carnival. Upstreet is putting on our Halloween event. We're going to be here at the church. Um, there's going to be games, there's going to be prizes, there's going to be candy, lots and lots of candy. Speaking of candy, it's not too late to donate. If you haven't had a chance to donate a bag of candy, you can drop that out in the lobby, or you can bring it uh, anytime this week during business hours. Just swing it by the church offices. We'll take it. We'll take late candy. Late candy is just as sweet. And then lastly, next Sunday, the 31st, we're going to be having our fall picnic immediately after church. Yeah, we're going to get together at Peterson Park. We're going to have some food. We're going to have some fun. We're going to get together. Uh, it's a classic. It's a church picnic. You know what it is. Be there. Uh, if you have a side dish or a dessert that you want to bring, you can sign up for that at the Church Center app um, or on our website and uh, let us know what you'd like to bring. And, uh, you know, the more food, the better, right? Right? Obviously. Right. <laughs> hey, go ahead and stand up. Let me pray for you, and we will be on our way. Father, thank you that you came, that you're with us, and that you go where we go, Lord. And so we want to go where you lead us. Help us to follow. We pray with the love of the Father, the grace of the Son, Jesus, and the fellowship of the, hum of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Go with God. See you next week.